I thought about it a lot. I laid out four reasons for the war, and then I was criticized in the Atlantic for the argument was reduced to one reason, which was a caricature of the reason. I gave a variety of reasons why the war happened. Mismanagement on the part of the West in relationship to Russia and foreign policy over the last, since the wall fell. It's understandable because it's extremely complex. Hyper-reliance on Russia as a cardinal source of energy provision for Europe in the wake of idiot environmental globalist utopianism. Um, the expansionist tendencies of Russia that are analogous in some sense to the Soviet Union empire building. And then the last one, which is the one I got in trouble for, which is Putin's belief or willingness to manipulate his people into believing that Russia is a salvific force in the face of idiot Western wokeism. And that's the one I got in trouble for. It's like, while well, you're justifying Putin, it's like, it's not, well, only, it's not only the Russians that think the West has lost its mind. The Eastern Europeans think so too. And do I know that? It's like, well, I went to 15 Eastern European countries this, this spring, and I talked to 300 political and cultural leaders, and you might say, well, they were all conservatives. It's like, actually, no, they weren't. Most of them were conservatives, because it turns out that they're more willing to talk to me. But a good chunk of them were liberals by by any stretch of the imagination. And a fair number of them were canceled progressives. Well, so, because you're very concerned about um, the culture wars that perhaps are a signal of um, a possible bad future for this country and for this part of the world, that reason stands out. And do you, sort of looking back at four reasons think it deserves to have a place in one of the four. Oh, because absolutely. It, because it is, you know... Uh, well, the four was bifurcated, eh? because I said, look, Putin might believe this, and I actually think he does, because I read a bunch of Putin's speeches, and I have been reading them for 15 years. And my sense of people generally, and this was true of Hitler, it's like, well, what did Hitler believe? Well, did you read what he wrote? He just did what he said he was going to do. And you might think, well, some people are so tricky... They have a whole body of elaborated speech that's completely separate from their personality, and their personality is pursuing a different agenda, and this whole body of speech is nothing but a front. Yeah. It's like, good luck finding someone that sophisticated. First of all, if you say things long enough, you're going to believe them. That's a really interesting and fascinating and important point. Even if you start out as a, as a lie, as a propaganda, I think... Hitler is, is, is an example of somebody that I think really quickly you start to believe the propaganda. Well, you're, really you, you've thought a lot about AI systems. It's like, don't you become what you practice? And the answer to that is, well, absolutely. We even know the neurology. It's like when you first formulate a concept, huge swaths of your cortex are lit up, so to speak. But as you practice that, first of all, the right hemisphere stops participating. And then the, the, the left, participates less and less until you build specialized machinery for exactly that conceptual frame. And then you start to see it, not just think it. And so if you're telling the same lies over and over, who do you think you're fooling? Think, well, I can withstand my own lies. Not if they're effective lies. And if they're effective enough to fool millions of people, and then they reflect them back to you, what makes you think you're going to be able to withstand that? You aren't. And so I do think Putin believes, to the degree that he believes anything, I do believe that he thinks of himself as a bulwark for Christendom against the degeneration of the West. And that's that third way that Dugan and Putin have been talking about, the philosopher Alexander Dugan and Putin, for 15 years. Now, what that is, is very amorphous. Solzhenitsyn thought the Russians would have to re return to the incremental development of Orthodox Christianity to escape from the communist trap. And to some degree that's happened in Russia because there's been a return to Orthodox Christianity. Now you could say, yeah, but the Orthodox Church has just been co-opted by the state. And I would say there's some evidence for that. I've heard, for example, that the Metropolitan owns, now I don't know if this is true, 
owns $5 billion worth of personal property. And I would say there's a bit of a moral hazard in that. And it's possible that the Orthodox Church has been co-opted, but there has been somewhat of an Orthodox revival in Russia, and I don't think that's all bad. Now, even if Putin doesn't believe any of this, if he's just a psychopathic manipulator, and unfortunately, I don't think that's true. I've read his speeches. It doesn't look like it to me, and he is by no means the worst Russian leader of the last hundred years. Well, there's quite a selection there. There, there certainly is. But, and I say that knowing that, even if he doesn't believe it, he's convinced his people that it's true. And so we're stuck with the, we're stuck with the claim in either case. And that's the point I was trying to make in the article. Sometimes I'm troubled by people that explain things. And I, I've, a lot of people reached out to me, experts, telling me how I should feel, what I should think about Ukraine. Oh, you naive, Lex, you're so naive, you know, here's how it really is. But then I get to see people that lost their home. I get to see people on the Russian side who believe they're, I, I genuinely think that there's some degree to which they have love in their heart. Uh, they, they see themselves as heroes saving a land from uh, from Nazis. How else would it's, you motivate young men to go fight? It's just, it's these humans destroying not only their homes, but creating generational hate, destroying the possibility of love towards each other. They're, they're basically creating hate. What I've heard a lot of is on February 24th of this year, hate was born at a scale that region has not seen. Hate towards not Vladimir Putin, hate towards not the soldiers in Russia, but hate towards all Russians. Mm -hmm. Hate that will last generations. And then you can you, you can see on, um, just the, the pain there. And then, then when all these experts talk about uh, uh, agriculture and energy and geopolitics and yeah, maybe like what you say with, with the fighting the ideologies of the woke and so on, I just feel like it's missing something deep that war is not fought about any of those things. War is started and war is averted based on human beings, based on well, here's, here's humanity. Well, another, here's another ugly thought, since we haven't had enough so far. We locked everything down for COVID. How much face-to-face -face communication was there between the West and Vladimir Putin? How about none? Yeah. How about that was the wrong amount? especially given that Europe was completely dependent on Putin for its energy supplies. Well, not completely, but you know what I mean. Materially and significantly. So maybe he had to go talk to him once every six months. Maybe he's in a bit of a bubble. Probably.